right. Saw a guy ask his first time here. He said, yeah. I told him I was the pastor. He said, can you preach good? <laughs> I said, well, do you know good preaching? <laughs> I guess that's the question, amen. Anyway, praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. <sighs> Joseph, Stephanie are back in the country now. Praise the Lord. United States of Texas. <laughs> Good to see them back. It's good to see you here today. Open up your Bibles with me. We are in this series of messages on Philippians. We're still in chapter 1. If you were here last week, we kind of began the study and the, the, the message out of Philippians on extraordinary living. And uh, began to see with our message in chapter 1, the first 18, 19 verses we looked at and began to see what was so extraordinary about this living that we have as Christians. You know, if we really get a grip on this whole thing of what it means to be a Christian, we discover there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, there's just nothing. When a person genuinely sells out to Christ and, and he's, he's really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing like that in the universe. I mean, that person is so unique and so extraordinary. They, they are literally inhabited by God himself. He, he actually moves in and we become this vessel. And we become the means by which God reveals himself in the world that we're in. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's what Paul was referring to in what we started with the letter last week. Those first 18 verses, 19 verses where we looked at. And he started talking about his conflicts and his chains and the circumstances. And how he conducted himself in the midst of all those dilemmas and tragedies that he was going through. How that, man, it, just, it just kept falling out for you know, more of God to be seen, more of God to be revealed, more of God's grace to be manifest. So he says all this is you know, it's just for the glory of God. And then he gets into verse 21, which kind of becomes the, the apex verse for everything that he's, he's just said, all right? He kind of wraps it all up when he's talked about the difficulty he's been through and it's how every opportunity, every bad situation or good situation has brought about a, a greater revelation of Jesus and a greater opportunity to preach the gospel. He starts off this next section here. He says, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Now that pretty much wraps it all up. Everything we've said last week in regard to all that he was experiencing, all the problems he was going through, he said, hey, no matter what kind of ordeal I'm going through, wherever I am, what's going on, it's, it's all about Jesus, for me to live as Christ. And then he goes on to say, and to die is gain. He said, but I, if I am to live on this flesh, it will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. I am hard pressed from both directions. I have the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much better. And by the way, it is very much better. And in fact, it goes beyond just better. It's much better. And it's more than just much better. It's very much better. Don't you like the way I put it? It is very much better. And unless they not know how to take that between maybe thought it, you know, he didn't like being around them or something. He says, oh, but yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now back up just a second. In no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. And again, that verse 21 is just the apex of everything he's just already said already and continues to flow throughout the whole letter. If you want one verse, I think, that summarizes the whole of chapter 1, it's that one, for me to live as Christ. So if you really want to know what my life's about, in fact, what any Christian life is supposed to be about, to live as Christ. That where I am, there's Jesus. Where I go, there's Jesus. What I say, there's Jesus. How I live, there's Jesus. It's you just, it's, I just become that vessel. I become that avenue. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, in the creation of all things, and you see the divine purpose for all things, when God creates man, he's, he was there, he said, let us make man in our image. And when he does that, what is happening? That wherever Adam and Eve are, there's God. Now, man sinned against God, fell in his sin, and lost that precious place of grace and glory and wonder and beauty. 
And it's only by faith in Jesus Christ that we can be restored to this original plan of God, that we might be a demonstration, a manifestation for God's grace and God's glory to shine through our lives. Paul gets this. He says, hey, whatever I'm doing, wherever I'm at, I don't care if I'm in jail, I don't care if I'm over here in Philippi, wherever, if I'm in Rome, I'm there, it's Jesus. It's just Jesus. Now, I, I don't know if that can be said about our lives, but I think we have to be honest at some point in our Christian walk in life to say, where am I? Where am I headed? Where am I going? I believe it's important that we have inventory. That's why I like that the Lord set it up that we should meet weekly. So we can do a weekly inventory of where we are. You know, Part of my responsibility as pastors to help us go through the inventory of where we are, examine ourselves, examine our hearts, examine the Word of God, and let God work in our hearts and let God work in our lives. And so I think we have to ask the question, you know, well, for me to live is what? In fact, what I've done with this passage, I've, I, I, I've broken it down into what I would call for politics sake, top six mistakes that Christians make. Now, for the rest of us, it'd be the top six sins that Christians make, all right? But some people prefer to call them mistakes. We'll, we'll go with you for a moment, but I want to understand that these mistakes are not just mistakes, they're mistakes that ultimately are just sin. It's disobedience to the Lord. And it breaks down to this, and although it kind of from a negative perspective here, there's a very positive things that we can glean from this verse, and I believe that when you leave here today, if you'll be honest with the inventory, as you look at your own heart and life, say, are these things in my life? And then adjust, if you're, if, you're, if you're doing these things, make the adjustment, then you'll see the revival that God wants you to have in your life, and you'll see the blessings of God, and begin to walk in that, what we call the extraordinary life from the book of Philippians. So let's look at the top six Christian mistakes, all right? Mistake number one. Get past that one. Mistake number one, we try to find meaning in life apart from Jesus Christ, all right? We try to find meaning in life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul makes it very clear, for me to live is Christ. Let's just erase the C-H-R-I-S-T in that sentence for a moment. And let's put in what for me to live is. I mean, for you to live is what? Well, for me to live is career. For me to live is family. For me to live is success. For me to live, you know, is sports. For, what, what's, what's the priorities of our life? Nothing wrong with family and success and life and all those things that come along with life. But the idea for the believer is, hey, those things are simply ways in which I can manifest for me to live as Christ. That my life's about Jesus. That people can see Christ in me. And that they hear Christ in me. That's not just going through the motions. And I think the biggest crisis facing many Christians today, and it shows a sign of spiritual immaturity, is they don't understand this context of what it means for me to live as Christ. But first of all, put it this way. There's no meaning to your life apart from Christ. Amen. There's not going to be substance to your life. If you, if you take Jesus and exclude him from the equation of your life, then you, the sum total of your life is zero. But I've done so much, Pastor, and I've accomplished so many things. It's still zero. The only things that really ultimately matter in this life right now are the things that will last forever. Amen. Well, Brother Joe, nothing lasts forever. Oh, that's where your mistake is. Everything we do in Christ, for Christ, with Christ, lasts forever. Our life, once we come to Jesus, is eternal life. You've heard me say it before, that doesn't begin when we die, even though he says to die is gain. Well, there's a lot to gain. Very much better, he says. But right here, let's move that aside for the moment. Right here, right now, where's Christ? What's he doing? How's he working? Is he being seen in my life? And do I have any, any reason you know, at this point, for Jesus to let me breathe another day. I mean, where am I at? He gets down here for me to live as Christ. Why? Because there's just no life apart from Christ. For me to live as Christ. What is it for you? Let's go to number two, because these all just kind of build on, on each other. Mistake number two is this. We think that God isn't interested in results. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, in Philippians, verses 20 through 26, he's talking about if I stay, what's going to happen? And he talks talking about it's fruitful labor. It's for your progress. Things are going to happen in your life. In other words, there's going to be a result for me and for you if I stay. There's going to be fruit produced. And too many Christians live their life like fruit being produced is not really important. Yeah, the way you have fruit produced is, if, again, back to the relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can go back to John 15 where it says, abide in me. That's the only way to bear fruit. But fruitful labor is a, is a terminology which I think is missing from many Christians' lives today. And it gets down to a simple question. What am I really doing 
for Christ. What am, what am I really doing in my walk with God, in my family, in my church? My, what am I doing for Christ? I, I love this definition, and I can't even remember where, where I found it for fruit. Fruit is the visible expression of power working inwardly and invisibly. The character of the fruit being evidence of the character of the power producing it. In other words, the character of Christ is seen in my life because he's in my life. He's invisible, he's working internally, and because he's there working internally, fruit comes out. It's like if, if you're an apple tree, it's natural and normal for the workings within that apple tree and the nature and the character and the makeup of that tree to produce what? Apples. It is the natural, normal process if we're living for Christ, walking with Christ, for Christ to be seen through my life. The fruit of the Spirit is what we would call that in Galatians, where he said it's love and joy and peace and meekness and self-control. All that's part of the character of Christ. In fact, if you really want a clarity on it, that love, joy, peace, the kindness, the self-control, all those things, that's just Jesus coming out. That's just him being expressed through my life. And when the Bible speaks of fruit, it usually speaks of it in two regards. One is what I'm speaking here. The life of Jesus is being seen. It's not just the life of Joe, it's Jesus in Joe that's being seen. But also, fruit, there's this external quality to fruit that, hey, it's out here, it's happening. In other words, as a result of Jesus living in me, things are happening out here. God's doing a work in your life. This is what he's saying, that I would remain for your joy. I would remain for your progress. Now, again, that gets back to a context of not a lot of people think of in the modern church today. We, we're living in a, a, a me-centered culture, and we've, we've got this consumer mentality even in the church. You know, what's in it for me? And people go to church, and they sh visit a church and say, well, what's in that church for me? What am I going to get out of it? What's there for my kid? What's there for my teenager? What's there for my, my marriage? And it's all about what I'm going to get out of the deal. And that works okay as a Christian when you go to Kroger's <laughs> or Walmart. But it has nothing to do with the church. When I look at a church, it's what do you have for me there, Lord, that I can serve, I can produce, and I can be interested in the life of others. He said, if I stay, he said, it's not for me, it's for you. And ultimately, we've got to get to this place in our life where we realize, hey, the only reason I'm here is not for me, it's for you. And that's the whole idea of what service is and ministry and, and, and helping people and, and working people's lives. He said, Listen, I'm here, and while I'm here, if the Lord has me here, then it's for this reason that something's going to happen. To, to, to remain is, is more necessary for you. So I'm here for you is the idea here. But again, boy, that's lost in the consumer mentality of the church today, is it not? I'm here for you. And it's a terrible mistake because we don't think that God is really interested in that part of our Christian life. But you can be sure that God is so interested in that part that, in other words, that something's happening with my life. In other people's lives, God's being able to use me that's not all about me. God's being able to use my life to touch other people's life, to make a difference in their life. That in fact, God is so interested, there's going to come a day of accounting. For those of us who know Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul wrote about the Bema seat, where prizes and rewards are received are lost. And it says that we will stand before that judgment seat of Christ, not this great white throne of judgment, where it's going to be the separation of the sheep and the goats, you know, lost and saved, and all that's going to go on. But this is just for Christians. It's the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I will have to stand before God and see very clearly, was there any fruitful labor from my life? My words, my actions, my deeds. Did anything result from me being a Christian other than me finding peace? So you see how big a mistake that is in our lives, amen? This is what Paul's saying, hey, don't miss this. To remain is needful, to remain is necessary, but it's, it's not about me. It's about doing something for the glory of God and seeing God work in your life. Number three, and they, they all really build on each other, is we don't practice what we believe. Philippians 1, he says, you need to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so whether I come uh, and see you, or if I remain absent, that I'm going to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit and mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The big mistake here is that we just don't live out what we say we believe. In fact, the King James uses the word 
Your, see that your conversation is in a manner worthy of the gospel. Conversation is an old English translation that, which was accurate back in the old days of old English, all right? And it meant your lifestyle. It wasn't just your words. A lot of people look at conversation in our culture and think about it, it's your words. It's, had a conversation with somebody. The word here for conversation has to do not just with your talk, but more in line with your walk. Conduct yourselves in a manner Live your life in such a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now take just that for a moment. What could be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Everything. My all. My surrendered life. My surrendered mouth. My surrendered mind. That's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, nothing less than that is really going to be worthy. It's not an acceptable offering as, the, as Paul talks about in Romans 12. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable. That's the acceptable offering. All is on the altar. This is the context of where he's speaking to the church here in, in Philippi. I said, hey, get it all on the altar, you know. You live your life in such a way, your conversation, your conduct, that brings glory to God. You know, I, I, I've, I've had the opportunity, and some of you have as well, to travel in different parts of the world. One thing I've always found interesting, I, whenever I go places... I run across tourist groups a lot. And I used to take a lot of groups to Israel and stuff. And a lot of times I'll be mixed in with the culture, you know, and then a, a group of tourists will come in somewhere. And they're rowdy and be rambunctious. And somebody will say something like this. One of the local citizens will say something like this. Don't mind them, they're Americans. <laughs> Don't mind them, they're Americans. And I'm thinking for a moment, it's kind of this cringing thing goes on just a moment while, you, while you're hearing all this. The word that Paul uses here for conversation and conduct, it's the word that has to do with, uh, it's, in fact, it's a political term, but it has to do with citizenship. He's, he says, you know, you're, you're, you're citizens of another kingdom, and you need to conduct yourself like you're citizens from that kingdom. Don't act like pagans. Don't act like infidels. Represent. Represent righteously. You, as Paul said later, you are ambassadors for Christ. It says even in Philippi, in the book of Philippians, around, I think it's 3, around verse 20, 21, he says, you have another citizenship. Your citizenship is in heaven, so live like you're the citizen from the kingdom. Don't live like you're a citizen from somewhere else. Before we meet Christ, we're just citizens of this world and citizens of this kingdom. But once we meet Jesus, the Bible says we're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and we should live as children of light. And this is the idea of conducting yourselves. It's the concept that he's talking about being a, 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 a civilian of a different kingdom. And they understood this, this uh, typology clearly because Philippi was a colony. It began as a colony of Rome, okay? And uh, lots of Roman citizens. So they understood the context of, of citizenship and, and what that means. So he's just suggesting and recommending and leading them to understand, hey, you're citizens of heaven. While you're here on the earth, you ought to realize that you're a heaven, heaven citizen and behave like that. And he uses kind of this, this whole expression of, of conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Good question to ask yourself often, is, I, is this my conduct? Is it worthy of the gospel today? It's the way I'm reacting. Is it worthy of the gospel? Now we understand that I don't conduct myself like that worthy of the gospel to get to heaven. Grace gets me to heaven. I'm saved, all right, as a result of my salvation, because of this new nature I have, I've been made a citizen, I ought to live out of that. I, I don't know where I got this, it was, it, the source was unknown, and it still is to this day to me. But <laughs> this anonymous source says, you're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds you do, by the words you say. Men read what you write, whether it's faithful or true, just what is the gospel, according to you. Isn't that powerful? What kind of gospel message is coming out of your life? Conduct yourselves in a manner as citizens of this kingdom. And then he, he moves to mis this next concept and what I'll call mistake number four is, is we compete with each other. And in verse 27, he says, Conduct yourselves so I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, Paul changes the context of where he's talking about the political citizenship and those things. And now he's talking about athletics because of the terminology he uses. The word striving together is where we get from that Greek word where we get our word for athletics. 
And what Paul's doing here, he's, he's picturing the church as, 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 as a unified being. As, as, you can use the word team, but it goes much deeper than that. We're a body. And we, we want to work together, not against each other. We, we, we all have the same goal in mind. Now, now, keep in mind, there was about the only negative we see in the book of, uh, of Philippians is there were these two women that were going at each other for whatever reason. It doesn't give us the details, but we'll talk about that later when we get to chapter 4, where he's talking about these women. Because there was division there. You know, the, the devil has his own motto when he sees the church and, and, and fussing with each other and, and striving against each other. It's, it's the old motto of divide and conquer. You know, let's cause division and then we can conquer through that division. And he's always happy to have some kind of division, stir up one believer against another letter, another believer. But throughout this, 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 this message that Paul gives to the Philippian church is an overriding theme, very clear almost from chapter to chapter of just unity in the faith, working together, striving together, living together, one mind, one spirit, one faith. The whole idea of we are one, we are one. We are not against each other, we are for each other. We may have a million different things in our lives, but we are still all on the same page because we are in Christ. And he's, he's emphasizing the importance of that unity here. In fact, in, in the Greek language, there's a prefix that Paul uses like 16 times, and it's, it's the prefix soon, all right? And it's, uh, this is the word in verse 27, it's sunateleo in the Greek, which we get the word athlete, athleo from. And it means to strive together, not just to be one, but when you add this soon, this prefix to it, I mean, there's this emphasis upon the strength of unity. And they're, they're, even if you go to John chapter 17 and you read that priestly prayer of Jesus right before he goes to the cross, he's spending time with the Father in John 17 and he's praying and he's, he's, he's affirming the fact that he's, he's there for his Father's will. He's reached these men and, and, and these people for the glory of the kingdom and that the Father's given to him. And he's praying that, Lord, just as we are one, that you'll make them one and when they're one, then the world will believe. There's just something that's undeniable about when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is walking in unity. They have the same heart. They have the same mind. They have the same spirit. And they're committed to letting God be glorified in their life. And what we're doing here is we're not just together. The idea is, is we're striving together. We're striving. What does that mean? It means we have a goal. What's our goal? To glorify God. Now, if we understand the goal and we all have the same goal, then we can have unity. And in that goal, there's also, this, there, there's also the, uh, the labor, the, the commitment, the, the call that comes out of that is, is the gospel of Christ. So we're all working together for the glory of God, preaching the gospel of Christ to the world around us. Living for Him, serving Him, serving each other, working together. And too many Christians, it's not about the fellowship. It's not about the family of God. Well, I'll get to church and I'll do my thing and you do your thing and we'll all be happy. Doesn't work that way. You know how God's chosen to reach this generation? The day how God's chosen to reach the world? It's called the mystery of the church. That the church, the saints of God, gifted by God, one together in Christ, serving Christ, can do things that no individual will ever be able to do by themselves. We reach the goal, we win the prize, we glorify the Lord, but we do it with one heart and one mind. And it's all about him. Don't make the mistake of getting competition with some other believer or getting at odds with some other person in the church body. Hey, you, you're going to be, you're going to have different opinions. How many of y'all married? <laughs> no different opinions in your house? All the time. Choose to love. You choose to forgive. You choose to move on. And you choose to move forward. Number four, we compete with each other. Mistake number five is we let Satan intimidate us in this process. Verse 28. Do not be alarmed by your opponents. It's a sign of destruction for them, salvation for you, and that too from God. The, the, the word that Paul uses here, again, in, in the, 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 the actual language of, of the scriptures of, that this was written in, he uses this word, don't be alarmed. It, it's the picture that the Greeks would talk about a horse. It would be chosen to be in a cavalry or in a battle, and the horse was trained for battle, but yet the horse wouldn't do what he's supposed to do. When he got to where the weapons were, or where the noise were, or where the battles were, he would shy away and pull away. And what he's saying here, don't be like that. Don't be afraid of a fight. Not with each other, we don't do that, but we do have an enemy. He says, so don't be, don't be intimidated by your enemy. 
Don't shy away from any battles. Now, we're not going to run blindly into a fight, but at the same time, we're not going to avoid our enemy. If you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to have some confrontations that will be in front of you. You don't run from the fight. As believers, we run to the fight. We realize that we are in a spiritual battle. This morning, I, I uh, had gotten ready, and I'm doing that thing I love doing in my life the most, waiting for my wife. <laughs> oh, and it's worth the wait. I'll add that. So while she's finishing up, I, I click on uh, Fox News. And there's a guy on Fox News, and uh, he's obviously very nervous. And uh, having a little hard time articulating himself. In fact, he finally admits it in the interview. But he was a Navy SEAL, and uh, they were interviewing him because he'd been shot 27 times. He said, Just anywhere you touch me, about I've been shot there. All in one battle. He said, one for some of the armor plating, I'd probably be dead today. 27 times. I'm thinking, ouch, you know. 27 times. He got shot in battle. I mean, when you go to battle, you might get shot, all right? <laughs> but he's not shy. He said, I came into a room, turned around the corner, opened the door. And he said, there were four Al-Qaeda guys armed with weapons, and they opened up on me. He said, before I, I had my gun up, he said, as I turned to pull my gun, they, they, they shot my gun. <laughs> he said, flew out of my hand. He said, I, and I started feeling the sting of bullets. You know, hit the shoulder, hit an arm, hit a leg, hit a groin. He said, sting of the bullets. He said, two things were mine. My pistol, <laughs> first thing in my mind. Second, God, get me out of here so I can see my daughters. He said, before that, I'd never had a personal relationship with the Lord. <laughs> he said, but I do now. Amen. He said, God, get me out of here and see my daughters. Amen. The beautiful thing about it was I'm sitting there thinking, how many Christians are so afraid of taking it, being shot at, you know? So afraid of running to the battle. Of course, he survived. The four Al-Qaeda guys are dead, you know, as that goes. I, don't clap your hands for the dead guys, okay? It just doesn't sound right in church. <laughs> But the idea here is too many people let the enemy intimidate them. And, and that's not just Satan. It's the world. It's the flesh and the devil, is it not? We, we let say, oh, you can't do that. It won't work. It's too big for you. It's not going to work. It's just, no way that can happen. You know, you ought to be afraid. What, what they say, what will they do? All those things come in our minds. It just intimidates us. And then our own flesh. Well, you know, and we start thinking about us. And uh, I don't know if we could pull that off. And it's, it's, it's more than I really want to invest. And all and on and on it might go. And sometimes it's just the world who puts pressure on us to back up, you know, keep that Jesus stuff to yourself. And we let those things intimidate us. And that is one of the biggest mistakes you will ever make as a Christian because you were not meant to shy back like the horse in battle. You were meant to run to the battle. I mean, and he said, the only thing that saved my life in that, in that, in that firefight was my training. And that's when he kind of stopped. He says, you know, he said, I said I'm, I'm sorry. And the guy said, why are you sorry for this? He said, I'm struggling here. He says, I, I, you know, I've never been on live TV with millions of people watching. And he was stuttering over. So he said, he said, I'm a whole lot more comfortable in fighting those four Al-Qaeda guys than I'm standing here in front of a TV camera. He said, because of training. That's the way it ought. We ought not to be uncomfortable in the midst of the world. We should realize who we are in Christ. That we, we do have that extraordinary life. So if I was like the world then I ought to be like that. I ought to be intimidated. I ought to be, I ought to be you know, shy and, and doubtful and fearful. But I'm, I'm not that person, and neither are you, because you have been made into a new creation in Christ Jesus, and that new creation has all you need. I mean, you got the training because he's reigning in you. And it gets back to the old resident and president deal. If he's just being resident and not president, you're not equipped. You got to let him take over. You don't let the enemy intimidate you. Don't make the mistake of falling into that scenario where you just let him, you know, take charge in your life. I know that a lot of new believers in Christ kind of come into the, to, to salvation, and I think part of this is because of misrepresentation from weak pulpits, weak preachers in America. But a lot of people come into this Christian life thinking that, oh boy, I'm glad I'm saved. That's the end of all my battles. Until they've been saved a few days. <laughs> Jesus said in John 13, the world's going to have tribulation. It's reiterated when Paul speaks to Timothy via the Holy Spirit. He says, hey, you're going to live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. And it comes in all different ways. And it comes through all different means. But don't make the, don't make the terrible mistake of, of, of just failing, all right? One thing he says here, these battles, these battles, 
or evidence of your salvation. Evidence of their destruction, they're going to lose, all right? You're the winner in this fight. And it's evidence of your salvation. It's proof that you do know that you know Jesus. You won't, those that don't live godly in Christ Jesus, they don't suffer persecution. But those that do live godly, they're going to suffer persecution. So he's just telling them, hey, if you're going through conflicts like this because of your faith in Christ, it's just a good sign. You ought to praise the Lord that you're saved. You know, you ever having doubts in your life, just look around, Satan assaulting you all the time, trying to get you to stumble and fail and falter. Oh, it's a good sign you know Jesus. He doesn't bother people like that who don't, that, 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 that know him and don't know God. If they don't know God, he leaves them alone. In so many different arenas. So, so just count this as proof. And the sixth mistake is this. We get in this situation as Paul is speaking to them. He says, you know, it's been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, now here to be in me. You see me suffering? Don't be surprised that you're suffering. Don't make the mistake that if you suffer, well, that's just not fair. And I've dealt with so many people in this, kind of, this place right here. It's just not fair, Pastor. It's just not fair. What do you mean? You shouldn't suffer because you're you? Because you're a special case? You know, you, if God wasn't working in you, bringing about the life of Christ, dealing with the junk that's in your life, washing out the garbage that's in your heart and life, then, you know, there'd be no, you know, the agitation comes from the washing machine, right? And some of you are in the agitation moments of your life. That's just the, the Spirit of God walking out the dirt, you know, dealing with the issues in your life. And for you to sit back and say, well, you know, nobody knows what I'm going through. He said, he said, Paul said, you've seen me in the mess I'm in. You see me, I'm chained to a prisoner 24 hours, a, to a guard 24 hours a day. I'm limited, I'm restricted, I don't have all the freedoms that everybody else has. I'm sitting in a prison cell. Don't think it's, that you're not going to suffer too if you love Christ. He said, if you, if you love me, you're going to suffer. In fact, he says, not only that, he says, don't think that you're the only one going through. In fact, I love the way he puts it. it, it we said that the, the suffering was proof, but you know what else is? It's also evidence, he says, it, it's a privilege. It's privilege. We're suffering for his sake. I like this word. It says, to us it has been granted. The word granted has to do with a gift. You say, oh man, that's not the gift I wanted to open. I'd rather have some other gift. I don't want to. Hey, if you're really going to live for Christ, get, get ready for it. It's coming. And just because, you know, you're going through it doesn't mean you're the only one going through it. I, I made reference to this a couple of weeks ago. You know, two-thirds of the Christian world today is under difficult, terrible suffering of persecution. I mean, ISIS is going through the Middle East and killing every Christian, burning every church. They're killing men. They're killing women. They're killing children who won't renounce Christ. And the beautiful thing about it is the testimonies I'm hearing, these kids aren't renouncing Christ. Amen. Children refusing to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ and being beheaded in front of their parents. Parents being beheaded. Churches being burnt down. It's happening all over the world. It's coming to America. Well, I'll put it this way, it's already in America. There's tremendous persecution and pressure against the church in America today like at no other time in our history. You know, there's, there's legislation constantly before our, before our Congress that's trying to limit what we can do as believers to silence us. We want to come up with, the, you know, a, a kind of religion that's, that's it's, uh, well, it's, 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 it's nice for everybody, you know, it's, it's appetizing. It's pleasing. We don't want any of this exclusivi exclusivity of the Christians, you know, that Jesus is the only way. Oh, there's got to be many ways. So let's silence anybody who says there's only one way. It's all around us everywhere we go. It's in the culture that we're living in. You stand up and say, well, the Bible says, well, who do you think you are? Why do you want to judge everybody? Now, put it this way. If you're suffering for yourself, there's no privilege. <laughs> If you're suffering because of your stupidity, and we've all done that, can I get a witness? That's no privilege, all right? That's not the gift we're talking about. But if you're suffering for Christ, it's a high and holy honor. If you're suffering for Jesus, if people are opposing you because you really love Christ, that's an honor for Christ. Now, I said it was, it's proof of your salvation, it's privilege of your salvation, but also let me tell you one other thing. He said, you know, it, it reveals this third element. You know, they're partners. You're not the only one experiencing difficult times. We're in this with others. We're in this with each other. Every one of us in this room, or at different times, we're going through different issues and different trials and different circumstances. 
And for us to kind of get in the corner and say, woe is me, and throw our little pity party, it's just a miserable waste of time. And the way to have victory in your circumstances is to find a way to minister to somebody else who's going through a crisis in their life. And to minister to them in the difficulty of their life, where the, where the attention is taken off yourself. Because all you're doing is looking here. It's what Chuck Swindoll used to call ingronious eyeballitis. Ingrown eyeball. Oh, poor was me, poor me. Nobody knows. Nobody understands. And it's so hard. My life's so difficult. I'm not trying to demean your situation. I just want you to see how pitiful it is when it's all about you. And how that goes nowhere. It leads to nothing. It produces nothing. There's nothing redemptive out of it. And it's certainly not making you more like Jesus. Really? They quit pouting and whining. You know? I told a guy that he just went on. I listened for about five minutes. And I'm sorry. You know, sometimes my counseling techniques are weak. I just look at him and say, wah, wah, wah. Come on, get the diapers out. Let's change them or something. Again, I, I, we all have problems. There's difficulties that challenge every one of us. But let's make them redemptive. Let's make them for his glory. Let's let those be the very things that shape us and transform us and make us more like Christ. This is, this is what he said, this conflict. In fact, the word conflict gives us the word for agony. That's the word, that the, the Greek word is agonia. It's the same word that's used to describe Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was in prayer and in conflict there. It's the same word. There's this agony, and it ought to produce in us the same thing that it did in Jesus in the conflict. It was not my will, but thy will be done. That has to be what pours out of it. It's not about me, it's about you. Can you be glorified in my life in this situation? Then that's what I'll choose over whatever I want. I want your will. In fact, let me give you the sermon I was going to preach this morning. There's three points. I went to this instead. All these things, all this produces, midst of the battle, produces consistency, cooperation, and confidence. Those are the three things that come out of this as well. But that's the heart of it. But if we make these mistakes, these six things I've listed, then certainly there's no consistency, no cooperation with God, with each other, and certainly no confidence is produced in our spiritual life. But if we'll strive together in one spirit, in one mind, one goal, one purpose, joining hands for the glory of God, then God is glorified. And then we can honestly step back and say, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. Stay single-minded. Remember when you wake up Monday morning, it's about Jesus. It's about Him being seen. Yeah, I work. Yeah, I go to school. Yeah, I'll be at this place. I'll be doing that. I'll be taking the affairs of my family in hand. I, but it's all about Christ. And I want Him to be glorified in my life. That's when it becomes real. And that's when it's more than ritual and religion. That's when it becomes reality. And that's when it becomes extraordinary living. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I thank you today for...